The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 10561 in the name of Graham Day on Earth Hour 2018. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please. And I call on Graham Day to open the debate for around seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, firstly thank all members who signed my motion, allowing it to be debated this afternoon, and can I place on record my appreciation of the cooperation of the Conservative Chief Whip, who I understand intends to contribute for facilitating a debate uh, uh, slot swap, which affords us this opportunity. Uh, last Saturday evening at 8.30, lights around the world went out to mark WWF's Earth Hour, the annual event, is a symbolic act of solidarity for the planet, marking the threat posed by climate change. Globally, hundreds of millions of people take part in Earth Hour events. Members of the public shared some great stories of on-the-night activity on social media. People held candlelit dinners, went on nature trails, staged upcycling and repairing workshops, and the 2050 group had a candlelit KOA. I'm not surprised to learn that research has shown that 85% of those participating in the initiative are likely to have been inspired to do more to protect the planet throughout the rest of the year. This is self-evidently good news, because it's ultimately behavioural change that will make sure that we're on the path that we need to be on in order to halt the worst impacts of climate change. This year, WWE asked members of the public uh, to not just sign up to taking part in Earth Hour 2018, but also to make a promise for the planet. Individuals have been making promises, including uh, when out and about, to use a reusable coffee cup or re, uh, uh, refuse plastic cutlery, uh, taking steps at home, such as switching to green energy and turning washing machines down to 30 degrees, or whenever they are to, where, or wherever they are, to reuse and compost leftover food. As I suggested in the plastics debate last month, we politicians may have thought that there was a, a need to prompt behavioural change and absolutely to facilitate it, but we are now most definitely seeing a direction being set by the public, effecting, effectively calling for us to make things happen. Whether it's television shows such as Blue Planet, the mess that those undertaking beach queens are finding, or the coffee shops that provided the carrot of a discount for reusing a coffee cup before the big change pleasingly started to, uh, doing so, there are numerous triggers for the public that are making them realise that we need to act. Some of the steps being encouraged may sound challenging. Just uh, think back to the days before the plastic bags charge and how quickly people got on board with that. Um, to, to see that, that, that the public will respond. In terms of the, uh, my constituency, I am delighted to hear that Arbro Dhabi participated in this year's initiative, Historic Environment Scotland, is a great supporter of the programme. However, presiding officer, my motion refers to Scotland being the first country to have all councils participating in Earth Hour. I was therefore disappointed to be advised by Angus Council that it would not be participating this year. Personally, I've previously highlighted Angus Council's involvement through, for example, its turning off its lights, raising awareness among staff and community partners uh, um, of climate change and school lessons. I've since learned through WWF that Angus Council were to be promoting Earth Hour through their intranet and social media channels. Forgive me for being underwhelmed when we should all of us be upping our effort, not rowing back. But out with the action or lack, lack of significant action from Angus Council, I know many constituents participated, as indeed did Guam's Castle. Those running the castle are in the process of implementing some very positive environmental measures. They're actively looking into powering the castle itself using their hydroelectric plant, which runs off the river by the sawmill in the village. This already powers the estate office and the provision of power to the castle would totally remove the need for heating oil and gas. Steps are also being taken to reduce the use of plastics. The thrust of this programme is to remove all plastic carrier bags from retail outlets and replace them with good quality paper bags. The restaurant will also be departing from plastics and starting this year, any disposable items will be carved. Charging points for electric vehicles are also going to be installed. As the castle says, with over 100,000 visitors a year, it may only be a small contribution, but it is a start. And let's applaud Glam's Castle and others who are journeying down the road we as a society domestically and indeed globally need to tread. And, President Officer, let me acknowledge that in other parts of Scotland, many other local authorities remain at the forefront of Earth Hour leadership. Dundee, Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, Highland Council, um, Glasgow uh, have all played their part uh, last weekend. And publicly owned Lothian buses showed a promotional animation on their number one route, which served 
uh, which is served by fully electric buses. The company, along with the Glasgow subway, the biggest transport providers in Scotland, uh, Scotland's two big cities, have both featured adverts for Earth Hour 2018. So what exactly are we doing all this for? WDF, uh, who deserve enormous credit for coming up with the Earth Hour concept, recently published a report, Wildlife in a Warming World, based on work undertaken by the University of East Anglia and James Cook University. The research concludes that up to half of plant and animal species in the world's most naturally rich areas, such as the Amazon and the Galapagos, could face total uh, sort of local extinction by the turn of the century due to climate change if carbon emissions continue to rise unchecked. Even if the Paris Climate Agreement's two degrees target is met, these places could lose 25% of their species. The Amazon, for example, has around 10% of all known species in its ecosystems, and it plays a crucial role in regulating the global, uh, global uh, climate. The region, though, is highly vulnerable to climate change. Even a rise of two degrees would threaten more than one third of species in all groups without them being able to adapt by moving to other areas. Let's look at Madagascar. A two degrees rise in global temperatures is forecast to make the country climatically unsuitable for more than a quarter of all species. The call for action, presiding officer, is crystal clear. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, the annual Earth Hour activities are clearly to be commended. However, Whilst they are important, we must remember that this is not only, that it's not only through action uh, now, it's the whole year round that we will have to undertake to be able to tackle uh, climate change and, and the, the challenge it faces head on. Good progress has been made here in Scotland in us taking responsibility for this, but we can't stand still. The Scottish Government's upcoming climate change bill provides an opportunity for us as parliamentarians to lay down a fresh marker but it's only with behavioural change, which, as I said, I believe the public is now largely leading, that we will get to where we need to be on this critical issue. President Officer, I look forward to Earth Hour and Lights Out 2019 and the positive measures that many, many climate change-related uh, change action citizens across the globe will undertake between now and then as a result of Earth Hour 2018. Presiding Officer. Our speeches of up to four minutes, please. Of Morris Golden, followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank. Uh, uh, I also congratulate Graham Day for securing uh, this members' debate, and have to confess that it was more convenient for me, uh, as a keen advocate of uh, climate change, to in indulge uh, the member in the switch. Um, I'd also like to thank WWF for their continued support across the world for uh, tackling climate change and indeed their efforts with respect to Earth Hour. Now, uh, locally in, in the west of Scotland, in both uh, East and West and Bartonshire Council, were awarded the WWF Earth Hour uh, Super Local Authority badge. I'm sorry to learn uh, about Angus Council, but I hope that next year they're in the running for that uh, particular award. Also in East Dumbartonshire, the lights were switched off at William Patrick Library in Kirkintilloch. And interestingly, the Education Department and NHS uh, worked together on producing a sustainable school meals cookbook. And I'm sure the children of East Dumbartonshire will be delightful in uh, tasting that uh, going forward. Um, also for this year's uh, promotions, there was hashtag promise for the planet. Uh, where individuals can make promises to, to take action to make a difference in climate change. And with that, that regard, I'd like to focus on a couple of materials which I think we should all be looking at more closely in terms of uh, cl uh, tackling climate change. And the first of which is, of course, plastic. It's uh, been in the media uh, as a result primarily of, of Blue Planet and David Attenborough. But, you know, the interesting thing statistic is that there'll be more uh, plastic by weight in the oceans uh, than there will be fish by 2050. Uh, certainly over the last 30 years about 8 billion uh, tons of plastics have been produced. However projections show that over the next 30 years there's going to be 34 billion tons of plastic 
produced. So that's an increase of over four times. That's a real worry. Uh, what we can do about it is, is firstly extend producer responsibility so those producers of plastic packaging uh, bear more of the cost of disposal and by doing that we not only begin to encourage producers to take responsibility um, for their products, we also begin to influence the design of those products and by designing those products in slightly different manners, we can both help to tackle litter, and I use an analogy of the, the old uh, aluminium tin can where you popped the, uh, the, 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 the ring pull off and you were left with two bits and the ring pull off and got discarded. We then redesigned that so that the ring pull maintains with the can. And it's that sort of development we need to see. Also in terms of plastic, we need to increase recycling and it'll be interesting to see how deposit return can impact on that. The second uh, area I'd like to highlight is that of gold. And uh, I was just ch chatting to my colleague, Donald Cameron, who got married 10 years ago. Now, 10 years ago when he got married for that gold ring which he places on his finger, to produce that gold ring, three tons of waste was produced. When my sister got married last year to produce the same gold ring, but not with the same uh, husband, clearly, um, uh, to produce that gold ring, 30 tonnes of waste was created. So the amount of waste created in the gold mining industry is increasing because the quality of ore is decreasing. There are 600,000 children employed in the gold mining industry worldwide, often in some of the poorest conditions. And I don't have quite enough time to explain about the use of cyanide, mercury and sulfuric acid in the gold mining industry. However, to finish on what we can do, there is more gold in one tonne of waste electricals that's discarded in the United Kingdom than there is in the ore found in the rock in Africa or Australia or China. So by recovering that and recycling more with respect to gold, plastics and all other materials, we can begin to tackle climate change. Thank you very much, Mr. Golden. I'm learning lots there. <laughs> Fascinating. I think you should have a debate all about that yourself. Uh, yeah, move on to David. No. <laughs> Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Maybe we'll just have a chat about it sometime. <laughs> and I have David Torrance to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to also thank Graeme Day for bringing this motion to Parliament today to recognise the importance of IFR 2018. I welcome this debate in the Chamber as it fosters greater dialogue about steps we can take to tackle climate change, both on an individual level and a legislative le level. Small changes that we make in our daily lives can collectively have a large impact on the environment, and the legislation passed in Parliament can nationally influence our carbon footprint. That is why today we recognise IFR 2018, providing individuals, businesses, organisations and governments such as ours a way to show solidarity in tackling one of the most pressing issues of the 21st century. According to the World Wide Fund, the last 25 to 30 years have been distressingly damaging on our environment due to climate change, pollution and overconsumption. The list of species affected as a result of these factors is staggering. 80% of freshwater species and over 50% of the population of land species have declined. Today, one in six of this planet's species are at risk of extinction from climate change. You can visualise the impact of climate change in the wildlife here in Edinburgh at the National Museum of Scotland. Go to a survival gallery in the National Natural World section of the museum and you will see walls of animals that are critically endangered are now extinct. The exhibit is sombre but important as it visualises the fact that the loss of species we are seeing today is estimated to be between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than that of natural extinction rates. This is why today we commend the WWF our campaign such a simple concept has a powerful visual impact and causes us all to pause and think about the implications of our daily actions on the environment. And I am proud that, as Graeme Day stated in his motion, Scotland is the first country to have 100% of its councils participate in the hour. In five, five councils switched off the lights in more prominent buildings, including Fife House, Rothsey House, Bankhead Central, Townhouse Kirkcaldy, the City Chambers, Dunfermline, and the County Buildings in Cooper to mark the event. But if our, as important as it is, cannot be the only step we take to tackle climate change. Such a symbolic event is designed not only to show solidarity, but also to spark action. And it is this action that we need to encourage to support within Scotland via grassroots initiatives, but also Parliament legislation. 
I am pleased that in Fife the Council has engaged in many diverse projects that tackle climate change. There are 55 energy efficient projects currently in the works for the Council buildings, including the potential stand installation of photovoltaic panels in schools and nurseries. The new Build Homes programme is achieving a fantastic BEPC energy rating, and the Council recently increased its electric fleet to 26. The Council is also launching three long term strategies aimed at reducing climate change this year, including zero waste res uh, resources strategy to reduce waste to landfill, the low carbon five supplementary guidance, and the sustainable energy climate action plan for low carbon and uh, energy efficient measures. With councils across the country taking equally promising measures to tackle climate change and are recording break record breaking renewable electricity generation, Scotland is a world leader in reducing carbon footprint. I am glad that Scotland participated so through in the FR 2018 and stood alongside the rest of the world with knowledge that by leading by example we can pave the way for a greener society. But let us also keep in mind the progress is never ending progress and we must remain committed to continuing to tackle climate change um, by small changes in our own lives and via forthcoming legislation from this Parliament. In conclusion, President Officer, I'd like to once again thank Graeme Day as well as the World Wildlife Fund for recognition of this important display of global solidarity in tackling climate change. Symbols such as the darkness of Earth Hour reiterate our commitment to preserving our planet and taking steps to protect its future. A commitment that affects our entire planet is not one that should be taken lightly. And I'm proud of the steps that Scotland has taken and, can, and continues to take for a greener Scotland and a greener Earth. Alec Rowley, followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you. President Officer, I believe climate change is one of the biggest concerns we face collectively as a society. Our planet is at a very real and serious risk of environmental disaster unless we make greater change and make that greater change now. This is why I was pleased to sign Graham Day's motion uh, welcoming Earth Hour 2018. On Saturday, like millions of people across the globe, I switched my lights off. I have to say I um, bought a few candles and it did take me back to the 1970s when we had the miners' strike. Um, but I also didn't really need the candles because Moss Morn was flaring all weekend. Uh, and if you live in communities around Moss Morn, then, then it's pretty lit up. And goodness knows what was going up into the atmosphere from Moss Morn. But that's, that's a discussion perhaps with the Cabinet Secretary we can have on another day. Uh, I was also welcoming the number of high-profile buildings in the region in Mid-Scotland and Fife, including Dunfermline Abbey, Castle Campbell, and many buildings in, in Perth, uh, Dunkel Cathedral, Stirling Castle. Uh, so, so very successful. I always think to myself, as a dad and as a granddad, that most parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles, we would walk to the end of the earth and back in order to protect our children. Yet the greatest threat to future generations is climate change. And that's why I think whilst Graham Day points to the fact that people are becoming more aware and, and demanding more action, I actually think we've got a long way to go and we need to do more to engage and to involve people. And again, I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, when looking at the climate change uh, bill that's going to be coming forward, we need to start to look at how we're going to engage people more and ensure that the people of Scotland are able to take ownership in the actions that we need to take to be able to meet the 2050 targets that are ambitious but achievable. I notice that WWF Scotland do say that we are making good progress and that emissions are now 41% lower than they were in 1990. And that, of course, is to be welcomed and it is good. However, they do point that progress uh, for cutting emissions has been slow in a number of areas. They talk about agriculture, transport, the heating of homes and buildings. And if we look at these areas, I think, again, we've got to understand, as the committee, as the convener of the committee knows, we, we discussed this yesterday in terms of agriculture. What are the issues there? We need to have a better understanding. In terms of transport, we know that 
the government have set this target that by 2032 there will be no further sales of petrol or diesel vehicles. We need to have that discussion in Scotland now. How are we going to actually get there and how are we going to reach that? And it is a scandal that in 2018 we still have people living with fuel poverty in Scotland. We have people this winter that have been cold in their houses because despite trying to heat their houses, the heat's going out the doors, out the windows, and it's poor heating in the first place. These are real things that we can do and we can do now that will have a massive advantage for some of the poorest and some of the most vulnerable in our communities. So this is a serious issue. There's a lot that government is doing, and all credit to them. There's a lot more that needs to be done and we need to get on with doing that job. And I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, we've got to look at how we engage the whole of Scotland in this process. Thank you. Mark Ruskell, followed by Liam McCarthy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I join members in thanking Graham Day for bringing forward this debate tonight and also thank WWF for continuing to lead on this work in Scotland and around the world. Earth Hour is ultimately really about creating a catalyst, um, bedding awareness of climate change into everyday lives and building that momentum for change. And this year, WWF asked people to make a promise to the planet to do more to protect the environment. We've heard about some of those suggestions, running a washing machine at 30, getting a, a reusable coffee mug. Now, these actions, of course, on their own make tiny, tiny changes, but as daily reminders and signals to government and industry, they can spur us on to deliver a much deeper and more meaningful change. And, you know, if we look at what's happened over the last 12 months, you know, there's been a lot of action that's been uh, catalyzed. I mean, who would have thought that an hourly TV nature program would have spawned a citizen's movement against marine plastics, uh, leading to governments to introduce deposit return schemes and plan for action against single-use plastic around Europe? And who would have thought just a few years ago that a ban on fracking in Scotland was achievable, given the huge vested interests that lined up against communities across Scotland? The fracking ban has now drawn a line in the sand. Um, it signals the prospect of an end to the fossil fuel age, which would have seemed perhaps hopelessly idealistic just a decade ago. And the actions of these citizens' movements have delivered change across Europe. We must now look to campaigns on fossil fuel divestment, for example, to deliver action that will have the farthest and most profound reach. Now, every one of us plans for our personal future through pensions funds, and these funds must take account of the future of our planet and the economy that it sustains. And I'll declare an interest here as a member of the Scottish Parliament Pension Scheme Trustee Board and emphasise that, of course, the health and performance of investments is the primary concern of anyone involved in the governance of any pension fund, whether private or public sector. But operating under those responsibilities doesn't preclude considering the views of members and also being wise to the fact that investing in fossil fuel reserves, which we have no hope of burning, is inherently risky business. The growth of carbon bubbles should concern us as much as the growth of housing bubbles, and citizens and scheme members should be parts of this divestment discussion. Now, the theme of this year's Earth Hour in Scotland has been around the impacts of climate change on the natural world, and if the planet temperature rises by two degrees, a quarter of priority species are at risk of extinction. And as we head towards debating the next set of climate change targets, it's important ref to reflect on the impact of aiming higher or lower on the natural world. We have a moral duty to do everything we can as early as we can. And of course, we've yet to make the really tough, transformative changes. And I'm sure looking back at the debate on whether to make soil testing compulsory or not will seem infinitely trivial in the Earth Hour debate of the 10th session of the Scottish Parliament, although hopefully Ross Greer or maybe Kate Forbes will reference this quote and reflect back on it. Who knows, who knows? Maybe even Mr. Golden, you know, he might still be here. Um, finally, presiding officer, in investing in uh, adaptation now is also uh, critical. Coastal wetlands, for example, can lock up carbon, buffer sea level rises, and create much needed habitat at the same time. And while the green budget deal um, was recently passed with the Scottish Government has accelerated action on marine protected areas, um, it is disappointing. We appear not to have seen any action from SNH and the government in creating a national ecological network over the last year. And it, it would be 
um, good given the theme of Earth Hour this, this year around uh, species protection to maybe uh, get some comments from the Cabinet Secretary on what we can do to, to really buffer uh, our environment against extremes of climate change. So, presiding officer, there's still much, much to do, <coughs> excuse me, in our homes, communities, fields, forests, seas, and parliaments, but I think the dots are starting to join up faster than ever, and the momentum for change is unstoppable. Liam MacArthur, followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I too uh, congratulate and thank Graham Day for securing uh, this debate and also pay tribute to WWF uh, on the Earth Hour initiative that's been running for, for 10 years. I've been a, a supporter from the get-go. Uh, I've even got a kilted panda to prove it. Uh, it did, of course, come at the cost of also having to wear a dolphin mask. Uh, but this is a campaign that has captured the public imagination, as others have said. It's demonstrated, I think, as Mark Ruskell rightly pointed out, that small steps taken together have a cumulative uh, effect. But I think probably more importantly, it sensitises the, the public to the broader uh, messages and the need for that wider uh, action and reform, not just on Earth Hour, uh, but year-round. The global impact is uh, unquestionable. The motion refers to um, the, the, the part played by the Sydney Opera House, Eiffel Tower uh, and Edinburgh Castle, if I could add to that, St Magnus Cathedral in my own uh, constituency, as well as the, the architecturally less impressive but no less committed headquarters of Orkney Islands Council uh, and NHS Orkney. And in terms of the, uh, the promise to the planet, which is, uh, of course, the message uh, being reinforced through Earth Hour this year, uh, I can update the uh, Parliament that ongoing negotiations in the uh, MacArthur household are reaching a delicate stage in the purchase of a, a hybrid vehicle, and more of that perhaps in due course. Uh, but the campaign, I, I do believe, is going from strength to strength at a local, at a national and at an international level. And as I say, it, it opens up opportuni opportunities to debate uh, more substantive issues. And I want to focus just on a couple uh, in the two or three minutes uh, available to me. Uh, those are biodiversity uh, and energy efficiency. As a species champion um, from the for the Primula Scotica, since you asked, Deputy President Officer, um, I'm very conscious of the, the threat posed by the loss of biodiversity and the, the link briefing um, they pointed to the State of Nature report uh, from 2016, uh, which suggests that one in 10 Scottish species is at risk of extinction. This includes plants, butterflies, uh, birds, including uh, puffins and kittiwakes. And where Scotland now ranks in the bottom fifth of all 218 countries analysed as part of the Biodiversity Intactness uh, Index. And Leaving aside the very justifiable concerns I think we all have about the, claims, the clumsy title uh, for an index, this finding, I think, should ask some, uh, act as a stark reminder of the work needed to restore and to protect habitats as a means of safeguarding uh, that biodiversity. Turning that now to uh, energy efficiency, Earth Hour uh, again should act as a reminder that here too, while we have made considerable progress, there is uh, an awful lot uh, still to do. Last week, on the eve of Earth Hour, I took part in visits in my Orkney constituency organised by the existing Homes Alliance. Uh, colleagues, I'm sure, will be aware that Orkney has the very dubious honour of being the part of the country with the highest level of fuel poverty uh, anywhere. And Friday's visits to an elderly couple who've benefited from measures taken under the Warm Home Scheme and also a local contractor, RS Merriman, uh, delivering high quality work under the scheme underscored uh, for me the social, economic and environmental uh, imperatives uh, of the approach that we, we take here. And to secure that win-win-win situation, we do need, I believe, a warm homes bill that remains ambitious in genuine eradication of fuel poverty, that properly recognises uh, that rural, the rural and island dimension to fuel poverty and how we tackle it, and translates the status of energy efficiency as a national planning framework priority into action and the budget to back it. But for now, can I congratulate uh, Graham Day again on not least on his negotiating skills with the uh, Tory Chief Whip um, and also congratulate WWF on keeping uh, the issue of climate change to the fore, not just for an hour, not just for a day, but year round. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> The last of the open debate contributions is from Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank Graham Day for bringing this important debate to Parliament today. 
uh, as he said on Saturday, uh, last Saturday, thousands of people in Scotland added their voices to millions across the world by switching off uh, Earth Hour in demonstration of solidarity to fight climate change. I attempted my own candlelit supper, though with young children involved, it wasn't the most peaceful of moments. Earth Hour is not just about raising awareness, but also stimulating action and indeed enthusing people. WWF research shows that in previous years, 85% of adults who took part have said that Earth Hour had inspired them to do more to protect the planet. And in a recent report of WWF, they've highlighted the grave problems facing wildlife, for example, across the globe as a result of rising temperatures, which lead to habitat loss and drought, amongst other devastating effects. And at this point, I should mention that I'm the species champion of the Merlin uh, bird. And the RSPB has said that one of the main reasons for the decline of the Merlin is, in fact, habitat loss. Um, despite the Paris Agreement, which, of course, as we know, aimed to limit the average global temperature uh, at 1.5 degrees, current national climate pledges would, would still result in a 3.2 degrees rise in temperature. If we just carried on with the status quo, business as usual would lead to a 4.5 degrees rise. That would lead to a staggering loss of almost 50% of the species found in priority places across the planet, and that is simply unacceptable. Now, while Scotland does not fall under one of WWF's priority places, we all acknowledge that we have an important, crucial role to play in environmental and wildlife restoration, given the fragility of our planet. As we know, Scotland is home to various carbon stores, such as sea locks, which were recently highlighted in a report by St Andrews at University, as one carbon store requiring greater attention. Peatland restoration is also important, as it is estimated by SNH that our peat bogs hold 1.6 billion tonnes of carbon and that degraded peatland emits substantial amounts of carbon dioxide. Nationally, we must ensure that we take steps to conserve Scotland's biodiversity and natural areas because, again, as SNH have stated, healthy ecosystems uh, help increase the resilience of Scotland's communities to the impacts of climate change. And through managing our many varied ecosystems, such as coastal habitats, we can help address the effects of rising sea level and increased storm surges. Uh, on a more local level, I'm extremely uh, proud to say that many communities across the highlands and islands made their voices heard on Saturday by taking part and switching off for Earth Hour. And I hope you'll permit me um, a few mentions. From the Western Isles, where lights at the Lewis War Memorial were temporarily switched off, to the highlands, where lights at Inverness Castle, Elan Donnan and Urquhart Castle, to name but a few, were all drawn into darkness for an hour. Can I also mention Kinloch Leven Library, which held a polar bear lantern craft making event uh, in honour of, of Earth Hour. And in fact, as we know, Highland Council, I think it's been mentioned by Graham Day, were awarded a 2018 Super Local Authority badge for their substantial contribution towards Earth Hour. It's not just local authorities in my region who have contributed, but to many constituents as well who've made pledges of support. Uh, can I also mention the six-year-old schoolboy Felix Hughes from Oban, who campaigned to find a way to recycle the thousand single-use plastic straws that he estimates are thrown away daily at his school. Deputy Presiding Officer, I applaud WWF Scotland for their efforts in promoting Earth Hour and encouraging more of us to get involved and make changes in our everyday lives. We must be bold as a nation in our fight to prevent damaging climate change, and I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that this issue is one that brings everyone across this parliament together. Thank you. I now call Rosanne Cunningham to respond to the debate for around seven minutes. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted that we again have the opportunity to debate support for climate action in Parliament today. I'm impressed by the level of participation in Earth Hour around the world and within Scotland, where 177 Scottish landmarks and monuments went dark. We've had an unusual tour of constituencies in this debate, and I'd just like to add to that, uh, given that in this year of young people, it's also good to know that many schools signed up. In my own constituency, Morrison's Academy in Creef and Ochel Tower School, Ochterarder, were among the over 1,000 Scottish schools taking part. So this is the 10th year of Scottish Government support for Earth Hour. We joined Saturday's switch off with St Andrew's House, Victoria Quay, Atlantic Quay and Softon House all going dark. And like Liam MacArthur, I also lent my support to Earth Hour going dark and joining in on Twitter with Isla the kilt-wearing panda 
for Pass the Panda, which I understand is the hashtag being used. This year, Earth Hour grew to include a hashtag promise for the planet, pledges by members of the public to make a lifestyle change as part of living more sustainably. And one of the most popular pledges was using a reusable coffee cup. Thank goodness, something I myself do, and I do urge other members to do the same if they're not already doing it. I, I also do wonder if these two hashtags are beginning uh, to flag up an Earth Hour fringe uh, developing, and it will be interesting to see if that increases again next year. Morris Golden talked about plastics, ring pools, and deposit return, uh, which was an interesting choice. I'm not going to enter into the gold debate, um, because uh, although as interesting it was it, as it was, it's perhaps beyond uh, for tonight's uh, members' debate. On plastics, can I reassure him that issues of production, design and manufacture are very much in our minds and will be represented at the June summit in Oban. Um, with regard to ring pools, though, I have to also advise him that I have a rather expensive de designer belt made from ring pools, which can be bought in a rather flashy shop in London, who, uh, a, a shop that makes belts and handbags that have become uh, quite sought after accessories. So all is not lost for ring pools. On deposit return, uh, also mentioned by Maurice Golden, I'm proud that Scotland was the first part of the UK to commit to introduce a deposit return scheme. I'm pleased to learn the UK government will now follow our lead. We have ambitious plans and we wish to work closely with the UK government to ensure that communities north and south of the border reap the environmental benefits a deposit return scheme can deliver. I'm currently appointing an expert panel to advise on environmental charges and other measures to prevent wasteful behaviours, which will begin its work uh, with consideration of disposable cups and plastic straws. And there will perhaps be more about that uh, in uh, other uh, chamber interventions. Graham Day rightly flagged up that public pressure is now driving change. So who knows where that will take us because it means behaviour change is happening. Uh, and that's an interesting development. And there's perhaps five years ago, something that we wouldn't necessarily have uh, foreseen uh, taking place. Members, including David Torrance and Alec Rowley and others spoke about climate change. Of course, 2018 is a big year in Scotland for climate change, as well as the climate change plan publication. This month, we awarded the 1,000th Climate Challenge Fund project. Next month, officials will hold a climate conversation with our youth parliament. And the coming months, we'll see the introduction of our new climate change bill, the establishment of a just transition commission to advise ministers on the transition to a low carbon economy, and the start of the process to develop the second Scottish climate change adaptation programme, which will no doubt be of interest to Mark Ruskell, given his focus on adaptation. Since 2008, the Scottish Government has, through our successful Climate Challenge Fund, funded projects to the value of more than £101 million, directly helping communities tackle climate change. Uh, and earlier this month, members may have noticed that the First Minister visited Wellshop Primary School in Glasgow to celebrate that 1,000th Climate Challenge Fund Award, which was made to Bike for Good, which of course is part of the uh, uh, switch to active travel. Influencing our everyday actions is key to delivering our climate change ambitions and individuals and households really can make a difference as is shown by the Earth Hour pledges but is also shown by the reaction to Blue Planet and the change that's coming about through the political pressure being exerted by ordinary people. Um, the Scottish Government is encouraging the public to do more through our Greener Together campaigns including our current Saving the World campaign uh, which you may have seen on social media, television and in cinemas. And Alec Rowley might be interested in knowing that as part of an ongoing engagement with the public, we initiated a series of climate conversations across Scotland starting in summer 2016 to take the temperature of public views on climate change and actions that might be needed to tackle it. By participating in climate conversations, people who do not usually talk about climate change are able to engage in the issues in a way that matters to them. And these conversations are continuing across Scotland. And the findings are feeding into the development and communication of climate change policies. I'm sure officials would be happy to share details with members if they're interested. Scotland was at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution and therefore has a responsibility to deal with climate change. That is why we already have the most stringent climate change legislation in the world, why we include emissions from sources that other countries exclude, and why we hold ourselves to account against annual targets. 
No other country does that. Now, the new climate change bill will increase the ambition of our long-term targets. In doing so, we will become one of the first countries to put in place legislation to play our part in meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. I want to just say something in the last few seconds about climate justice. Um, we've been climate, uh, uh, championing climate justice since 2012, when we launched the, uh, the world-leading climate justice fund, and it was a world first. A total of £21 million has been made available up to 2021 to support some of the world's most vulnerable people in becoming more resilient to climate change. And last year, we launched the Climate Justice Innovation Fund as part of the wider Climate Justice Fund. So I'm pleased to announce that the second round of the Innovation Fund has been opened today. I look forward to funding another round of innovative and exciting climate justice projects. So it's good to see the enthusiasm that EarthR has generated and I look forward to working with everyone across the chamber as we make the transition to an environmentally and socially sustainable low carbon economy in Scotland. Our plans are ambitious and everyone's support will be crucial. Thank you. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.